Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the University of Denver Spotlight Colorado event. My name is Kevin Carroll. I am the uh, Chief Marketing Officer and Vice Chancellor here at the University. We're glad you're here and we're excited to share with you insights of what Colorado voters are thinking about. We hope this forum will give you a deeper understanding <coughs> of Denver, Colorado, and the University as you prepare for the first presidential debate at the University of Denver on October the 3rd. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Chancellor of the University, Robert Coombe. Well, welcome everybody and thank you for coming. Uh, it's a great pleasure for us from DU to be here today uh, to talk about all of the different kinds of things that are happening in Colorado in advance of this momentous debate that's going to be happening on October the 3rd. I thought I would just say a few words uh, about our university to begin. Uh, some of you may know us well, but I would imagine that some of you don't know us terribly well. Uh, we're a private institution of about 12,000 students, and we've been in Denver for a very long time now. We are coming up on our 150th anniversary in just a couple of years. We were founded in 1864 uh, in Denver. In this part of the country, I know that that doesn't seem to be terribly old, <laughs> uh, but uh, for Colorado, it really is. The, the city, uh, Denver, uh, dates its founding from just a few years before that in 1858. And so when DU was founded, uh, Denver was little more than a mining camp of maybe 3,000 people or so, uh, supporting all of the folks that were rushing into Colorado. Uh, uh, to go up to the gold fields up in the, up in the mountains. Uh, so we've been around uh, for virtually as long as the city of Denver itself from that time when it was a you know, few thousand people up to the present uh, when there are nearly, or slightly more than actually, three million people uh, in Colorado and over the, in Denver. Over the course of that time, uh, uh, over the evolution of the city, evolution of the state, there have been lots of ups and downs, lots of booms and busts, uh, and our university has <coughs> been linked into that. We like to think that the character of the city, the character of the state, the character of the Rocky Mountain West has grown into the character of the university, so you will find us to be uh, particularly creative, particularly open-minded, particularly entrepreneurial. Uh, particularly invested uh, in our city uh, and in the people of our region. And really that's a big part of the re uh, reason that we were interested in holding this first presidential debate uh, at the University of Denver. There really, uh, there really hasn't been one of these. I think there's been only one uh, uh, really west of St. Louis. And so when we first started thinking about this, uh, we, we thought we had a chance of getting the debate because of the pivotal position that Colorado occupies uh, in this election year. And a lot of that will be talked about uh, this morning. Uh, but it's something that uh, will be terrific uh, for the university in many ways. First of all, terrific for our students. It's a singular opportunity to really engage our students, our faculty and staff, our alumni population distributed throughout the United States and all over the world. Uh, in the electoral process uh, and what it means to be uh, an American and that has already begun. I can tell you the campus mood is incredibly excited, incredibly excited. It's working really well uh, for us at DU. The visibility is tremendous. We know this is going to be watched by lots and lots of people. But the truth of the matter is that hosting a debate of this kind, there's, some, there's something else fundamental about it. It's just the kind of things, kind of thing that a university ought to do. We are fond of saying that DU is a great private university dedicated to the public good. <coughs> and hosting a debate of this kind uh, is something that a university that is really invested in the broader audience, invested in the people of our city, the people of Colorado, uh, all kinds of people throughout America and the world. It's simply the kind of thing that universities should be doing now. So we are very, very <coughs> proud indeed to be the host of this event on October the 3rd and are looking forward to it with great excitement. 
a fair amount of trepidation, as you might imagine. Uh, but uh, in general, it's going to be a tremendous thing for our students in the city and lots and lots of people. Thank you for being here today. So throughout our 148-year history, we've enjoyed a close working relationship with the city of Denver. Uh, our work together in preparing for the de debate is no exception. So it's my pleasure to introduce Rowena Aleg Alegria, the Director of Communication for Denver's Mayor Michael Hancock, who will share just a few comments from the mayor. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for being here today, and I'm really excited to be here myself. Um, I'm Rowena Alegria, Communications Director for Mayor Michael B. Hancock. And on his behalf and on behalf of the city, I would like to extend to you a warm invitation to come to Denver. And we want you to know how excited we are to be hosting the first and likely the most watched of this year's presidential debates. And presidential debates have the potential to make history. Think Lincoln Douglas on slavery and Kennedy Nixon answering questions from Walter Cronkite. This year, Colorado has the potential to change the presidential election, as a panel will undoubtedly address. Um, so the import of this debate at DU in October cannot be understated. And the city of Denver, along with our partners at the university and the state, are truly honored to play a role. Denver's been on the world stage often in recent years, welcoming the Democratic National Convention, the USA Pro Cycling Challenge, which is going on right now, uh, the Summit of the Eight, and John Pope John Paul II, for example, um, with the fifth busiest airport in the United States and the 10th in the world, Denver's become a gateway for our nation, as well as a global destination, just this year adding new international flights to Japan, Iceland, and Mexico. As you'll see when you arrive at Denver International Airport for the debate in October, DIA is booming with construction underway on a $500 million expansion that includes a hotel and a rail station. The growth at our airport reflects the strength and diversity of Denver's economy, which is the third strongest in the country. Metro Denver ranks third also of all major metro areas for its 2011 job growth rate. The city leads the nation in new construction jobs among 337 metro regions in the US and our residential real estate market is the second best in the nation. While many urban areas nationwide are losing residents, Denver is growing. We're some 30% larger than we were in 1990, largely because of our quality of life. Our downtown is thriving with shopping and dining and entertainment. There's always something to do, no matter what your interest. We hosted the only US showing of the Yves Saint Laurent exhibit earlier this year, will soon kick off the only showing of a new Vincent van Gogh exhibition. And as I speak, the Book of Mormon is on a sold out run in Denver. <laughs> <laughs> With 300 days of sunshine every year, we spend a lot of time outside too. Hiking, biking, skiing, we're the healthiest city in America. <coughs> We're also a sports crazy town with pro teams in football, basketball, baseball, hockey, soccer. Anybody heard of Peyton Manning? <laughs> it's no wonder Denver's been named the number one city for 25 to 34 year olds, a magnet for the future workforce. And it's tops in best places to do business as well as among the nation's most wired cities. Our mayor, who graduated from Denver Public Schools, works continually to make Denver even better to grow our economy, take care of our kids, and deliver a world-class city where everyone matters. On behalf of Mayor Hancock and the city of Denver, we stand ready to welcome each and every one of you to the Mile High City in October. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rowena, and thank you to the mayor. So now let's get on to the event. Uh, first, I have the privilege of introducing the moderator, Dee Dee Myers. Many of you already know Dee Dee, serving as the White House Press Secretary during the Clinton uh, administration's first term. She was the first woman to hold that position. She's also the author of the book, Why Women Should Rule the World. Oh. And today, she is the Managing Director at the Glover Park Group, a respected political analyst and commentator. Please welcome Dee Dee Myers and the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, Chancellor Rowena, uh, and thank you to all of you on behalf of the Glover Park Group. Let me welcome you and say uh, thanks for sharing uh, some time with us this morning. Uh, we're all very excited about the first debate. Of course, in the Clinton 
uh, campaign. I, I spent time at three of those high wire acts, and uh, they are a fascinating endeavor to be sure. Um, but uh, of course, the backdrop for today is Colorado more broadly. Uh, it is a swing state. That's certainly one of the reasons the Commission on Presidential Debates chose Colorado, uh, Denver, and DU specifically. Um, and so we're going to drill down a little bit on why Colorado is a swing state and what people like us who are interested <coughs> in this topic might be looking for not only in the, what is it, 44 days between now and the debate, but only 78 days between now and the election, and Colorado is going to play prominently. Um, we are really blessed to have a great panel with us today, a lot of expertise across the board. I'm going to introduce them briefly. You should have their bios because they are all truly uh, remarkable uh, and well-schooled uh, individuals. I'm going to start uh, at the far end with Guy Cecil. Um, Guy is the executive director of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, the DSCC. He's also a former chief of staff to Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado and ran Senator Bennett's successful reelection campaign in 2010. One of the squeakers. They were still counting votes on Wednesday morning in that one. Um, next to him is Dr. Seth Maskett, uh, associate professor of political science at the University of Denver. Among other things, he studies political parties at the local, state, and national level. Uh, Dr. Lisa, uh, Lisa Martinez, who's an associate professor of sociology at the University of Denver with a particular expertise in Latino, Latino issues and in immigration, which obviously figure prominently in this cycle. Uh, Dick Wadhams, a Republican political strategist and former chair of the Colorado Republican Party. He's a veteran of numerous, numerous campaigns in Colorado and around the country uh, and also worked for no, uh, several Colorado senators over the years. Uh, next to him, Dr. Sam Kamen, who's a professor of law at DU. Uh, he studies law and social science, but among other things, he's an expert on medical marijuana, which we'll hear is a, uh, is, is a pretty important issue in this cycle in the state. And finally, uh, last but certainly not least, Dr. Robert McGowan, who's a professor of management at the University of Denver. Uh, so uh, once again, I encourage everybody to, I'm going to toss questions around, but feel free to um, you comment on each other. This is going to be a conversation, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. But I'm going to start with you, Dick. i will put you on the spot a little bit. For a long time, maybe a couple generations, Colorado was a reliably red state. In 2008, Obama won. In 2010, after a close election, Senator Bennett was reelected, and now it's a swing state again. What changed? You know, Didi, I think one of the mythologies uh, as the Democratic National Convention came to Denver uh, a few years ago was that Colorado was a reliably re red state. In fact, Colorado uh, had a generation of uh, Democratic leaders like Dick Lamb, Roy Romer, hadn't elected a, Demo a Republican governor in 24 years until Bill, Bill Owens won. And so it wasn't as red as, as you might think. It's always been a very competitive state because of that, um, that, that slice of the electorate, the unaffiliated and Republican women in the Jefferson County and the Rappo County suburbs to swing back and forth. And uh, maybe it's gotten more pronounced in the last few years, but that is the, uh, the sliver that makes any campaign in Colorado for president, senator, or governor competitive. And it'll be competitive again this yes. year. Um, let me uh, pitch it over to you, Guy. You ran, as we said, Senator Bennett's campaign in 2010. Uh, it was a difficult year for Democrats. What did you learn in, in that election about Colorado that you might, uh, what, what advice might you give to, to President Obama or his team, or might have already given, um, about how do, how do Democrats win in Colorado? Well, one, I think Colorado really w foreshadowed what outside spending was going to be like. Uh, it was the largest amount of outside spending of any state in the country, which produced the closest Senate election of any state in the country, and I think we're going to see a lot of that this cycle. But Colorado, like a lot of the West, really shows that demographics is destiny. And you have, one, a growing Hispanic population, Latina, Latina population. It was about 13% in 2010, and uh, 2008, about 12% in 2010. I think it'll be bigger than that this time. And I think as large as our margins were, uh, the president has an opportunity to expand even further uh, the margin of victory given the policies of the romney Ryan ticket. And then second, which I think Dick touched on, really is uh, the independent, unaffiliated women in the, in the suburbs of Denver. If you look at uh, why uh, Senator Bennett won, it was in large part to maximizing our vote amongst uh, the Latino community and then really uh, dialing in and communicating directly with women uh, in the Denver market. And uh, the margins that were created there is really what led to victory. And I think a lot of that same dynamic is uh, going to happen in the, in the election in 2012. 
So we're going to see a lot of uh, focus, obviously, on specific demographic groups, which brings me to you, Dr. Martinez. Um, one of the, key, as, as Guy just said, one of the key swing constituencies is the Hispanic population. Is it, is it a swing, and how important is it uh, to either party to win the state in 2012? I think the Latino vote is integral to what happens in 2012, and I think we saw examples of that in 2008. Uh, the state did go heavily for Obama, but in particular, uh, the data that I saw suggested it was something like 67% of Latinos came out in support of Obama relative to about 31% who came out for McCain. So I think it, going back to Guy's point about demographics being destiny, when you consider that Latinos are pretty much the fastest growing demographic group in the state, they're going to have a lot to say with regard to what happens uh, in the future of Colorado politics. Um, and uh, Dr. Maskett, um, how, okay, so we, we know that there's these key constituencies, women, Latinos, undecided voters. What are we seeing in Colorado so far uh, about tactics? What, what's driving the campaign day to day? Is it television advertising? Is it GOTV efforts? Is it some combination? Is there a new tactic that we're seeing there? Well, we're seeing a lot of television so far. I, I believe uh, between the two presidential campaigns, they've spent something like 13 and a half million in the Denver market. Um, which is you know, one of the top markets in the country right now for presidential campaign spending, another three million in the Colorado Springs market. Um, and uh, I expect this will continue. The, 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 uh, uh, the television ads are, are pretty well saturated. Um, what we're also seeing is a real focus from both sides on voter turnout. Um, there's very, you know, relatively few actually undecided voters. Um, they're already seeing everything that they can see on TV. Um, so what the campaigns are doing is they're building a lot of field offices, which is how they, they develop their volunteers and, and actually knock on people's doors, which is, um, political science suggests, it's actually the most effective way to, to get a vote out. Um, so we've seen uh, the Obama campaign has already built, I think, 48 field offices in 24 different counties right now, um, not just in Democratic-leaning areas, but also out in El Paso County, which is where Colorado Springs is, um, Mesa County, which is where Grand Junction is. These are pretty Republican areas, but that have Democratic voters in them. Uh, the Romney campaign, I think, has built uh, nine field offices in nine different counties, but, and they're continuing to build more. That, that seems to be where a lot of the battle's going to be. So who, who gets their voters to the polls? Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, um, between now and then, issues are gonna, or we hope issues will be part of the discussion. For so much of this campaign, we've been hearing that the economy would be the single most important issue. Now, in recent weeks, because of uh, Mitt Romney's trip to Europe, the Olympics, and most recently the selection of Paul Ryan as Romney's running mate. The focus has shifted away from that, but Dr. McGowan, let me ask you, um, is the economy still the most important issue to Colorado voters, uh, and how are they feeling about it? Well, <coughs> Colorado, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, sort of in a holding pattern right now in terms of, <coughs> sorry, I took the red eye in from <laughs> He was watching, he, he I was went at the to Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon yes. so <laughs> we all have our priorities. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I, you know, I think the business model in Colorado's changed a lot. We used to have larger corporations there. Now we're starting to see more small and medium sized. Still a very entrepreneurial state. But people, we didn't get the big bump that I think people expected after the last election. People are sort of holding back a little bit, particularly in terms of employment. Uh, hiring new workers. Uh, there's a big debate about outsourcing, um, and that, that's part of the campaign, too. Uh, so Colorado's really in a holding pattern, I'd say. And so voters are feeling uh, anxious, but just they're not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, well, it's not they're not seeing the light at the tunnel. It, they just hope it's not a train coming at them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, it's just the, the fact that uh, people really are uncertain about where the economy's going. And that has to do with uh, employment, uh, what kind of workers you're going to hire, uh, investments in education, which is one of the issues that I think we really need to talk in, in Colorado about, is investment in higher education, because uh, that's one of the areas where that's going to be our future. Yeah. Um, so every election has its national issues in, in each state. It also has its local issues. And uh, I come to you, uh, Dr. Kamen, on uh, there is a uh, Prop 64 on the Colorado ballot. Mm. Uh, it would legalize and regulate marijuana the same way alcohol is regulated, largely along the lines that alcohol is regulated. Uh, it's become a pretty high profile issue and could, could affect uh, turnout and, and, first of all, talk about the importance of that issue and how you see it 
playing out in the election. Sure. So there's uh, 17 states and the District of Columbia have now passed medical marijuana laws so that even though marijuana is still uh, prohibited at the federal level in its manufacture and sale or serious federal crimes, uh, in now about a third of American jurisdictions, the voters uh, of those states have, have said that medical marijuana is something that their citizens should have access to. In 2010 in California, we saw uh, a, a similar initiative to fully legalize marijuana, that is to make it available for recreational use. Uh, and we saw the Obama administration, uh, Attorney General Holder, come down quite strongly and say, you know, we've tolerated medical marijuana in the states, we won't tolerate legalization. Uh, It'll be, curious, it'll be interesting to see whether something similar happens in a presidential election year in, in Colorado, in a swing state. Uh, it, it was easier to, to, to come down pretty heavily against it in, uh, in a non-swing state in a non-presidential election year. So whether, whether we get a similar uh, confrontation between state and federal uh, government will, will, will be sort of one thing I'll be watching this year. What's the polling showing? Is it going to pass? It's currently leading, but it was leading uh, going into, you know, with, with a few months ago in, in California. Um, it's one of those things that it's, it has uh, support, but it's not yet at 50%, so there's a majority, but, but enough voters are still undecided that uh, it, its success is not at all clear. No state has gone this far yet. It would be sort of uh, throwing down the gauntlet uh, of, of state governments against, against the federal but government. Aren't, and aren't there more um, places you can buy <coughs> medical marijuana than there are Starbucks? Yeah, that was one of the, that, that's, <laughs> you know, our, our state pride. Um, <laughs> It was, we had a real explosion in, in our industry, uh, or in the industry in, in our state, and um, the, uh, Colorado was one of the first states to really take medical marijuana regulation seriously. We have uh, sort of pages and pages of regulations in the Department of Revenue, and it's uh, sort of was the, the regulatory model that we have has been put out as a, a model for other states that uh, the, the federal government is very unhappy with medical marijuana, but it seems like Colorado is doing it best. And some people in the industry there really hope that that would be enough to keep the, the federal government at bay for a while. That would be a fascinating uh, experiment here. <laughs> um, okay, so that's kind of the lay of the land here. Let, let's get into some more politics. Um, you know, the biggest news in recent weeks, the biggest game changer in this has been the selection of, of Paul Ryan as uh, Mitt Romney's running mate. He has been outspoken on a number of issues that are obviously going to be uh, consequential around the country and in Colorado. Dick, how do you see that choice affecting the outcome in Colorado? I think it was an uh, important choice for Governor Romney to make because I think the campaign was slipping away from Governor Romney. And we saw three national polls the Friday before his, uh, his announcement of, of uh, Congressman Ryan showing him down anywhere from seven to nine points. And I think in Colorado it was a great choice because it will force the discussion of some important policy differences. I was dubious about the Romney campaign strategy of essentially being not Obama. I don't think that's a winning strategy and I think it was reflected in the polls. What Romney does, I mean what uh, Ryan does is two things. It inspires the Republican base, which Romney needed. And second of all, it will drive a very important discussion on the right issues. And uh, I think it will, uh, there's been a lot of talk about how he will not, um, uh, help inspire uh, Hispanic voters, for instance. But I will tell you, if we can get this campaign back on a, a true discussion of the economy and talking about how uh, Hispanic and, and African American kids are being failed in, the school, in our school systems, high dropout rates, and also that there's a much higher unemployment rate among those uh, citizens, then I believe that, uh, we can, that he will be an asset with, uh, with those voter groups as well. Um. Guy, you want to jump in? I mean, some of his positions are uh, really very conservative. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know how that plays with swing voters in a place like Colorado. I think it does highlight what are some of the key differences between the two presidential tickets. And I would just quickly highlight three areas. The first is, which we only glossed over in this discussion, issues around choice and around contraception. Mm -hmm. Colorado has had two uh, ballot initiatives on personhood, both which failed dramatically. And one on the ballot this year as well. That's right. And you've got uh, at least one of the two that have come out in favor of personhood, uh, which for all intents and purposes essentially outlaws choice. Uh, and, and when you look at the election in 2010, it was a critical issue, uh, particularly for women in the suburbs of the Denver market. And I think that's why you see uh, the president at his most recent rally in Colorado uh, surrounded by women focused on women's health security. Right. It's why you see their television ads reflecting that. Two, I think the idea that adding Ryan to the ticket is somehow uh, <coughs> going to improve uh, the relationship of the Republican Party with Hispanics 
defies logic. I mean, the reality <laughs> is that Mitt Romney, through the course of the primary, made very clear uh, where he stood on key issues that affect uh, Hispanics, uh, not just in Colorado, but around the country. And I think it's going to be, um, I think we're actually going to see a higher percentage of Hispanics turn out in favor of the president. And then third, which has gotten most of the attention, is the issue of Medicare. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, Crossroads and other groups for basically three years now have been running on uh, what is a lie, and that is that the president has somehow cut $700 billion from Medicare. Um, the reality is that adding Ryan to the mix here really does crystallize the fact that the discussion about Medicare is not a referendum on a lie that Crossroads is perpetrating, but rather it's a choice about the two parties and about who do Americans and Coloradans trust on that issue. And so I think on all three of those issues, um, we will see the differences between Romney and the president crystallize even more than they would have if he had made another choice. So it really puts the spotlight, uh, at least some Hispanics. I mean, does that, is this a game changer for Hispanics? Or does it just, like Guy said, sort of make things clearer? Well, I think the first thing that's important to point out is that the Latino population in the U.S. is quite diverse. And so I think it's the case that Democrats can't necessarily assume that they're always going to align with the Democratic Party. Having said that, I don't think the selection of Paul Ryan as Romney's running mate will necessarily sway Latino voters uh, who were either perhaps on the fence. Um, that is to say, unless they were probably already aligning themselves with, the, with Republicans and with Romney, I, I don't think that Ryan is going to have much sway uh, in, in changing their perspective one way or the other. Um, so the, um, uh, to talk a little bit about the parties in Colorado, because I know it's one of your areas of expertise, are how, how, how strong is party alignment and where does the Republican Party uh, line up? Is it, cons is it in line with Paul Ryan and his rather conservative views or is it more diverse or to the middle or what? Well, the parties right now, if you just look at um, uh, where, where the voters are, um, look at the most recent stats on, on party registration have uh, Republicans at about 33% of the electorate, uh, Democrats at about 32%, and 35 are calling themselves unaffiliated. Wow. Um, so that's is some, that one of the higher states in the country? It is. I think nationally it's, it's roughly uh, a quarter, and here it's, it's more than a third in Colorado. <coughs> um, so that's an unusually high number of unaffiliated voters, and um, they're not all completely independent, but um, they're, they're a little harder to pin down. Um, and there is sort of a, an independent streak to Colorado's uh, political culture. So um, the Republican Party itself in Colorado is somewhat diverse. Uh, there's, I think, a difference between a, a, a Western state, more libertarian-style Republican, and, say, a more cultural conservative Republican from uh, Colorado Springs in that area. Um, and I would tend to think um, uh, uh, the, the Ryan message lines up more with um, the, the Colorado Springs-style Republican. Might play in, in the Denver area suburbs, but uh, that's, that's sort of, uh, you know, time will tell on that. Um, you know, the... Um one of the other issues that's obviously been big in Colorado and got a great deal of attention nationally, but less so now, is the shootings in Aurora. Um, and obviously that was a tragedy that, um, you know, kind of raised some questions about gun laws. Um, it seems that that's not an issue that's going to resonate. Uh, Sam, you're, you know, this is something that I know that you pay a lot of attention to. Um, is it, ha has anybody's mind been changed by that and it, will it have any effect beyond the tragedy? It, it's hard to know. The, um you know, we saw one a story that got a lot of national press was that gun sales actually went up fairly significantly in Denver uh, the week after uh, the, the week after the shooting. So uh, it didn't seem, at least in Colorado, to, to be the impetus for for gun control laws. Uh, it has generated a fair amount of uh, discussion of the death penalty um, that the you know people say you know well if we if we're saving the death penalty for the worst of the worst it certainly looks like we is have it, and there is a death penalty in Colorado we do have a death penalty in Colorado we don't use it very much we've only had one execution uh, in the last uh, 35 years so um, you know it, it's it, this is has got people thinking again about whether uh, we should continue to have the death penalty and if so when and how we should use it so that's another issue that may that may come to the fore and will that resonate at all in the in the political culture on this election or not? it's funny crime and justice issues crime and criminal justice issues have not been uh, at the forefront in the last uh, sort of couple national elections uh, I think the fact that crime is down nationally has has really sort of taken that off the off the front burner uh, there is a lot of interest and concern about uh, about um, crime and safety and uh, uh, and also the the death penalty recently whether that turns into an issue that, that voters will vote on 
you know, we'll, we'll have to see. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come to the audience in, in just a minute with, um, uh, and ask you for questions. So please uh, be ready, whatever you have on your minds that you want to ask. But uh, uh, Dr. McGowan, um, w one of the, we sort of, Guy and Dick have both touched on this is sort of, um, this election will be an opportunity for the two sides, I mean, sort of a, a bright contrast between what is the role of government. Um, what is the, how do Coloradans see the role of government in the economy? And how do you think um, they view this election through that prism? Well, <clears throat> Colorado's kind of an interesting state in the sense of uh, they, they view the role of government as being more, should be more passive uh, versus active. Uh, we still have a very entrepreneurial streak and pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And, and there's a big debate about should we provide incentives for big businesses versus small businesses? And small businesses say, well, you're chasing the big business, but what about us? And so it's a big concern in terms of uh, the role the government should play. And I think Colorado, particularly with uh, Governor Hickenlooper, who's a businessman background, is starting to present a sort of a pro-business uh, image outside the state. Now, going back to cycle back to the Aurora question, that's had a pretty interesting effect on the image of Colorado. I mean, you have Columbine, <coughs> and you have the Aurora, and uh, I was talking to someone from Aurora, and it, it's, it's a tough issue for them because uh, it's a lose-lose deal. And how do you get people to, uh, can't make a positive out of it, and so it, it affects our image outside of the state more than I think people realize. And, but less so in the state where people live every day. Yeah. I, th I think that's the case, um, and businesses say, I want to go to a place where it has quality of life, right. and that's always an issue in terms of that. Also the medical marijuana issue as well. I gave um, a talk for the county sheriffs of Colorado, <coughs> and that's a really hot button for the they're against law that. enforcement. And, uh, they are really concerned about this Proposition 64. Does anyone want to wager whether it passes or not? <laughs> no Depends on what you're yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> Ticket to the Book yeah. of Mormon, obviously. Um, what about Governor Hickenlooper? I mean, you sort of mentioned that he's creating a <coughs> pro-business or a, I don't know, a, a pro-business democratic kind of. Im does, will he play a role in this, um, Guy Dick? Do you guys want to comment? I mean, he's a, he's the most popular governor in the country, right? He's uh, been in office 19 months. His approval rating is like in the 70s. Does that does that help? Absolutely. No, I, look, I think if you look at the type of Democrats that have been winning in Colorado in the last couple of cycles, uh, both Hickenlooper and uh, Senator Bennett come from business backgrounds. They bring a, I think, slightly different perspective on how we uh, use government to support small business, to reward entrepreneurship, to invest in a new energy economy. And I think Governor Hickenlooper fits right along that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I think he might be speaking at the convention. Um, and I think he's taken a very active role in uh, the Obama presidential campaign. So I think he's uh, nothing but an asset for the president's campaign and for Democrats and our brand. It's sort of a role model for how mm, Democrats sure. can win in, yeah. in purple states. Yep. Didi, I do, I do not think that he will spend a lot of political capital for President Obama. He'll, he'll do the, the required thing, showing up at a few rallies. He will not expend a lot of capital. But my personal prediction on Governor Hickenlooper is that uh, he will seek the 2016 Democratic nomination. And, that, uh, field. and by the way, he, <laughs> he will not run for re-election in 2014 ah. in order to, to vote himself to that. Uh, one final comment. I can't let my friend Guy Cecil get away with uh, <laughs> some earlier comments. Guy, uh, it, there's no wonder that the Obama campaign will trot out the issues of, 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 of the, on, on abortion in this campaign because when you have an 8.3% unemployment rate in Colorado and it's gone up in the last month, and such a failed economic record, that is the only message you can try to reach those, undefe those undecided voters. But um, when you, the, the Obama agenda is bankrupt, and that's the only issue they can play. And, and that's, so I just, I couldn't let that one go by. Yeah, well, feel free to jump, <laughs> you know, uh, at anyone else. Look, I do so. think it's a, it's, a, it's a different perspective. Um, Democrats believe we can walk and chew gum at the same time, that we can talk about the economy <laughs> and talk about choice. Um, we saw just yesterday what type of right-wing Republicans um, their party is supporting with um, uh, the Senate candidate in Missouri's comments um, about rape. And um, the only thing I would, I would, not the only thing, but one of the things I would disagree with Dick on is uh, the idea that if Hispanic voters only paid attention to the economy, that somehow they're going to change their perspective. Um, my guess is that Hispanic voters in Colorado don't want to see Pell Grants cut. They don't want to see interest rates on student loans rise. 
Uh, they want to see the type of education reform that, frankly, Governor Hickenlooper and Senator Bennett have uh, strongly supported in the state. Uh, they want to make sure that uh, their parents and their grandparents have the type of Medicare coverage uh, that's been promised to them um, as a result of their paying into the system. So I actually think that on economic issues, um, and this is part of the reason why the, the President's campaign has um, also run ads on those, um, that we're still going to uh, be successful in communicating with the two key constituencies uh, that will ultimately determine the election in November there. Hispanics and women. Yep. Um, Lisa, what's the effect of the President's deferred deportation policy, which took effect last Wednesday and seems to be met with enthusiasm by young Latinos around the country? I think it'll have a considerable effect, um, given the fact that it happened in the middle of August, coming up you know, a couple of months before the election. It's the thing that people are going to remember when they go to the polls, and I think it's the thing that people are going to help sway them as to whether or not they're actually going to participate. And you know, going back to the points that Guy made, you know, Latino voters are interested and concerned about the state of the economy. Joblessness disproportionately affects them. Uh, the foreclosure crisis disproportionately affected them. Um, they want access to affordable and quality education. They want access to affordable health care. Uh, but another big issue that obviously affects Latino communities is the issue of immigration. So even if it might not necessarily affect them directly, personally, they know people, right? Family members, people that they work with, people that you know, go to their children's schools. And so by virtue of the fact of uh, pushing through deferred action, I think that's going to have a, a significant impact on the Latino voters. Still, though, I think most people would suggest that it's, it's still not enough. There's still a need to push for comprehensive immigration reform, and that this is just one of many steps that need to be taken in achieving that goal. And you know, the president did preside over a period of increased deportation, right. uh, so that may be a little bit of a mixed bag. I, the issue of increased deportation certainly has happened during this administration. Um, I just don't know if it's had the same kind of impact as far as swaying people in the other direction. So again, by virtue of the fact that this is the most uh, recent initiative in this regard, I think that will, will have some important uh, effect on Latino voters. Or it could just be the case that people won't show up. So uh, that's also an issue. Right. And um, anyone want to make a prediction about turnout? I mean, given that that's both sides, there, there isn't a huge amount of, uh, there is a small pool of undecided voters. Most people seem like they've made up their minds. Um, and so the parties each are kind of reaching out, let me just kick this to you, Seth, um, reaching out to their bases, trying to motivate their bases. Will that drive up turnout or do you need to go to the middle? Um, turnout was already pretty historically high four years ago. I mean, I would expect it to be right around there. I don't know uh, how much more you can you can squeeze out. Colorado has a history of relatively high voter turnout. Relatively high, yeah, um, and it, it'll be. I mean, it was already a pretty hotly contested state four years ago. I mean, given that its its reputation now is kind of, I guess they're calling it like the swingiest of the swing states. It's like right <laughs> in the middle, and it can go either way. So even more so, we're going to see a lot of campaign efforts focused there, and that might nudge turnout up just a tad. Yeah, I think that could be. We should pitch that to Governor Hickenlooper as a new state motto. Yeah, the swingiest, <laughs> of the swing states. Um, fantastic. Uh, is there anybody in the audience who wants to um, ask a question? Don't be shy. Yes. Yeah, coming live from Le Monde newspaper. Uh, you didn't mention the energy at all. Le Monde in Paris. Hi, I'm Corinne Lenn from Le Monde newspaper in Paris, yes. Uh, you didn't mention the energy issues at all. I think I went to Colorado four years ago, and this was really a big uh, issue in the Western Slope, especially. If you could mention that. And, and what's the image of President Obama in, uh, in Colorado? Thank you. Great. Um, why don't you start with, Bob, with the energy uh, issue and then we'll, uh, we'll on the policy piece, and then we'll get to the politics of it. Well, I think there was a lot of <coughs> discussion about clean tech, uh, you know, four years ago, but I think the investments that we're seeing in alternative energies have started to back off in terms of that. Uh, it, you know, it's still a lot of doubt how long it's going to take to be proven and, and our dependency on coal, which is still pretty high in Colorado. So the alternative energy issue, I think, has really uh, eased up quite a bit. You I mean, correct me, but you really don't hear a lot of discussion uh, lately in Colorado about it. Is it is it going to be a is energy going to be an issue for either side? Uh, is this something that the Romney campaign will try to make an issue of? 
Didi, I think that it, it ties all, it, everything ties back to the economy and, and to uh, the unemployment rate in Colorado and um, coal has been under assault um, uh, on the western slope. If you remember Governor Romney actually went to Craig, Colorado and northwestern Colorado which is a, a big coal mining producing part of the state. Um, I, I think that energy will in terms of its, its, its tie into the economy overall. But is there a, are there many jobs in Colorado dependent on uh, either clean energy or new technologies that will lead to clean energy? Well, I know, and I'll, I'll bring it up before Guy and, does And, and also, does the, the, does the state see itself yeah. as a place where those kinds of ideas are born and nurtured? Yeah, there is, there is a, a difference between Governor Romney and uh, the Colorado Republicans, uh, most of the Colorado congressional delegation who, who are Republicans on w the wind energy tax credit. Right. And that is a difference. I do not think that will play uh, a huge role in the general election, but there is a difference between, between them on that. What yeah, I mean, I know breaking news, I pretty much agree. <laughs> Look, I don't think it's, <clears throat> I think in the construct of the economy, it's an issue. Um, I don't think it's a top three issue as a standalone. Um, the one thing that wasn't mentioned, obviously, is natural gas and the increasing role that it's playing mm -hmm. in the state. And I think you've seen uh, both senators and the, most of the congressional delegation in both <clears throat> parties um, eager to figure out, you know, common sense solutions to support the natural gas industry in the state. You also have um, a reasonable number of smaller um, oil producing companies. These aren't the Exxons of the world. These are more, you know, mom and pop, small business type shops um, that are producing in Colorado on top of the clean energy. And so I do think it's um, a great example of identifying three, four, five different solutions to solve the energy um, crisis. But I don't foresee that it's going to be determinative of, of who wins the state. Um, Dick, you mentioned earlier when we were talking that um, the most Colorado voters vote by mail and that absentee ballots or mail ballots drop a few days after uh, the debate. Uh, so talk a little bit about how you think the debate might affect um, outcome and what the stakes are as both candidates look to October 3rd. Is that inter the first time we'll see them together on a stage any time uh, in, in this campaign? Yeah, the debate is, is crucial to the campaign period, but especially given the timing of the dropping of what are called permanent absentee ballots in Colorado, essentially a mail ballot. Uh, county clerks across Colorado can, be, can begin dropping those ballots literally the following week. And so uh, Colorado voters will be, will be getting a, a very good look at these two candidates on the stage at University of Denver before these ballots drop. The last numbers I looked at was uh, approaching 70% of the electorate is on the permanent absentee ballot. As Huge. Guy well remembers from his days with Senator Bennett's campaign, it's about a three-week election period now. And it's, um, um, it, it pr certainly creates havoc for campaigns, I, I will right. tell you. But, when uh, it highlights so. the field piece of it, too, which was mentioned yes. earlier. And that's one of right. the advantages that I think the president is building. I mean, Craig Hughes, who was the manager for Senator Bennett, is running the Obama operation there. You mentioned, I think there are over 50 offices now. There are you know, a couple hundred staffers that are all working. I mean, the permanent absentee ballot um, program is ripe for uh, campaigns who have strong field programs to really use to their advantage because it does expand, changes the way you run television, right. changes your events, changes your entire GOTV period, but you have three weeks of election days. So how, would you, how, how do campaigns then tactically drive toward that day? Right, because you're going to have such a, a, a news um, roadblock at, in the wake of the first debate. So how do you strategically um, think about that? You've got to run a lot of television and put out a lot of mail before that, uh, that week of no October when those ballots drop. And hope people's minds Be don't Because a huge change. portion of that 70% will vote right away. And then there's a lull, and then there's a, a rush at the end. Right. So, it's, it's And I think bad. just, you know, right, and just in terms of, you know, having the capacity to monitor the returns. I mean, you mm -hmm. can access who's returned mm -hmm. their ballot, who's not returned their ballot, um, the one-on-one -on -one communication, the canvassing, the phone banking, all the things that we normally think of in a more compressed time period now really take place over a, a month. And so if you, if you don't like auto calls in Colorado, <laughs> um, I would suggest delisting your number. <laughs> uh, if you don't like, you know, if, if you want to see the Geico lizard or the Aflac <laughs> duck, just don't watch any television until November, <laughs> in November because um, it, they're already feeling it, as was mentioned. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, 
you won't be able to buy a television spot in the state no. by the time October comes around. Mm -hmm. For the whole month? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think you'll <laughs> see the, the market's completely saturated. Um, I think you'll have campaigns in you know, mid-October who are trying to buy time, who are forced to choose between, you know, QVC at 3 a.m. or <laughs> ESPN Classic at 4.15 a.m. Yeah. because um, they're just not going to be able to buy Prime and broadcast if you wait too late. And it's why campaigns are already, you know, reserving historic amounts of time. Third-party groups are reserving time much earlier than we ever have. The only people who like uh, uh, this, uh, this election situation in Colorado DD are the TV stations. Yeah. <laughs> and they make a lot of money off this. Yeah, and, and, the, yeah. and the brokers who... Good right? time to invest yeah, yeah, there in you a go. TV station yes. if you have any capital. There will around. be no shortage of uh, <laughs> interest. Um, Seth, in your research over the years, and I don't know if you focus on this specifically, but do <clears throat> debates change people's minds? In other words, if so, and, and, and we'll, I'll let you answer that, actually. Um, to a very small extent. I mean, there, we can think of probably a few debates uh, in history that, that have been unusual, um, uh, where, uh, for example, um, the, in, in 2000, uh, there was a widespread belief that uh, Al Gore kind of underperformed. And so you, you could actually see the polls shift shortly after that in um, uh, Governor Bush's favor at the time. Um, for the most part, it's, it, there's a very small amount of shifting um, for the simple fact that uh, of who's watching the debates. It's the people who are mo the most passionate about politics and for the most part have already made up their minds. Um, the rest of the country eventually gets the message about how people did, but uh, they don't cause a lot of an, an immediate shift toward one candidate over the other usually. And some effect on undecided voters, but it perhaps dissipates over the course of a month? It's, it's, it's somewhat muted. It, it com gets communicated out to them over the course of a week. And if there is a bump, yeah, it probably washes away after a little while. Yeah. Um, let's go back to the audience. Um, uh, yes, in the back, Mr. Jonathan Martin. Hi, John. <coughs> um, what a great collection of talent up here. Um, my question is about um, women in Colorado. Uh, those of us who follow politics closely know that one of the chief reasons why Senator Bennett won in 2010 is because there was a, uh, a sharp gender gap uh, in that in that race. Um, what do you guys see in the polling uh, in Colorado in terms of the uh, women vote? And um, secondly, what do you see from the Romney campaign in terms of uh, targeting uh, uh, women, uh, radio, phones, mail, what have you? Feel free to jump in on this one. Uh, Dick, you can start. And go then ahead. we'll go to Guy and anyone else who wants to comment. Well, look, it, it, comparing apples to apples, you know, our campaign was really just engaging <laughs> on television at this point uh, in 2010. But I think if you look at uh, the public polls, the gender gap is about where it was at this time. Um, and I expect that it'll get pretty close, uh, if not exceed the Bennett margins uh, in November. Um, in part because, structurally speaking, uh, the entire party has, uh, for all intents and purposes, adopted the same position on the issue of personhood, uh, on the issue of not making exceptions. I understand that uh, Governor Romney put out a statement saying he believes in, in exceptions for rape, which is not, uh, is not Congressman Ryan's point of view. And I, I think at this point, uh, because of the actions that the Republican House has taken, because of the movement to the right that Romney was forced to adopt um, as a result of the primary, um, that a lot of those key differences on choice and contraception are going to be as strong as they were in 2010. But I do think on issues around Medicare, and we overlook this because a lot of times we don't think education is a driver, but this issue around Pell Grants and student loans, I believe for uh, women in the suburbs, women everywhere, is a really critical issue in this election. And do you believe the way to invest in our country is to cut Pell Grants and to return student loans to private banks who get to drive up interest rates? And that's why you see, I think, the president communicating specifically about these things um, in Colorado in a way that he's not necessarily in every state. So I, I think there's an opportunity to, to continue to expand that gap. But it's about where it was at this particular time in uh, in 2010. I'm going to guess Dick doesn't agree with that. <laughs> exactly. But Jonathan, uh, <laughs> you asked the operative question. I mean, there's not been a campaign, in, a competitive campaign in Colorado, going back to the 1970s that hasn't had this demographic: re, uh, Republican women and unaffiliated women in the Jefferson and Rapo suburbs that have decided a close election. But I think the Democrats are about to overplay their hand on this issue. Yes, guy, it worked in, in uh, 2010, 
because my friend Ken Buck uh, kept giving you a lot of ammunition <laughs> that you could shoot him back with. <laughs> and so, um, so that was, but, but if you look at the uh, examples of Governor Bill Owens, Senator Wayne Allard, uh, Senator Bill Armstrong going back to the, to the uh, 80s, is, is that a pro-life Republican can certainly win in Colorado if first and foremost their agenda is economic in nature. And that's precisely where I think the Romney-Ryan ticket is. They're not going to give Ken Buck-like ammunition to Guy Cecil's allies in Colorado in 2012. And on top of it, I think voters are actually smarter than this, to just, uh, women voters are smarter than just to buy off on a strict abortion or straight abortion message that uh, Guy and his folks want to run in Colorado. The fact is, economic concerns are number one. Every poll shows it in Colorado, and these voters are going to be looking at these candidates. And that, uh, that unemployment rate among all, all, all people in Colorado, and then if you, and, and once again, I keep going back, the, the Obama's failed policies uh, have, have truly failed Hispanic and African American uh, uh, folks, and, and especially, especially among young African Americans and, and Hispanics. The, the unemployment rate is so much higher in those, in those groups. And so I, I think the economic, economic message is going to be the driving force and not this very narrow uh, silver bullet that uh, the Democrats think they can play every election in can Colorado. I just one other quick thing? I, I just don't think that choices around contraception are a narrow little thing it's, that is only being used for politics. I think, it, I think for women, young women, Hispanic women, African American, white women, the issue of contraception is not just about women's health, although it's obviously a critical piece. It is symbolic of the nature of the politics of the person that's supporting it. And so, as I mentioned, I think Pell Grant, I think there's gonna be a host of issues, not just contraception and choice. But I do think to minimize contraception and choice as an issue and say, we shouldn't talk about that because people also care about Pell Grants or about the economy. We can do both, and I think it's important that women voters in particular have a clear understanding that the Romney ticket is not just bad on the economy, but that the, the Romney's position on issues around contraception and choice are to the extreme, and the reality is that on, maybe not on rhetoric, but on policy, Romney Ryan is closer to Ken Buck than he is to a lot of Republicans that live in those suburbs in Denver. So I think both of these things, the economy and the issues around choice and contraception are gonna be key in the election, and should be. Uh, Dr. Should Martinez, be. is there a gender gap among, is the gender gap about the same among uh, Latinos as it is among a whole population, or is it different? In terms of voter turnout? Yeah, just in terms of their voter preferences? Um, I would say that Generally, Latinos are perhaps a little bit more comparable in terms of their position on policy issues uh, than perhaps the, the general electorate. Um, and again, kind of going back to uh, Dick's points earlier, um, I, I think you're absolutely right that in this election, Latinos are perhaps looking more critically at Obama and Democratic um, elected officials, but I also think that there's a serious issue in terms of the Republicans as far as providing an alternative. Um, and not to say that the entire party feels this way, but you have some pretty vocal individuals on the margins who many people uh, feel are sort of shaping people's perceptions about uh, the Republican Party in general. And so I think that that's part of the issue where, uh, going back to an earlier point I made about maybe Latinos just won't turn out in numbers commensurate uh, with the general, with 2008. Um, another question from the audience, yes. Yes, uh, my name is Akio Fuji. I'm uh, <coughs> from Nikkei, Japanese newspaper. Um, my question is uh, not only for Colorado or more general United States, and many see uh, uh, United States is very divided, and uh, we see a lot of division of opinion on Medicare and the uh, role of government. So my question is, after this election, wh whoever wins, uh, are you confident the U.S. will unite again to cope with problems like fiscal cliff or other difficult issue? Um, Seth, why don't you take this? You've written a book on this topic, haven't you, <laughs> about political <coughs> divisions and <laughs> Can yeah. they be healed in the wake of this election? <laughs> it's, it's a pretty deeply polarized country. I mean, by some measures, we're about as polarized as we've ever been. Um, the Congress is, is pretty much, you know, Democrats are all pretty liberal and Republicans are all pretty conservative. Um, that doesn't mean things can't get done. Um, the, you know, there are certain moments of crisis when parties are able to come together. Um, 
when there was uh, uh, one party control of the federal government just a couple of years ago, uh, the Democrats actually passed quite a lot of legislation and, and Obama signed quite a lot of legislation. Um, now that we, we seem to have settled back into our um, uh, split party control, yeah, people have a hard time coming to agreements. Um, it's not necessarily in their interests, in their, in their own electoral interests to work with the other side. That can actually work against them um, in, in terms of their own politics. So yeah, I, I, I don't expect that to be resolved anytime soon. Uh, another question? Yes. Uh, Laura Marler from the Irish Times. Um, I know there are, there's a very high concentration of evangelical Christians around Colorado Springs. Um, is that th representative of the entire state? Are there a, a higher number or higher proportion of evangelical Christians in Colorado than elsewhere? I know, for example, Iowa has a very high number. Um, does anybody have an estimate? And, and how will that sort of counterbalance for the Republican Party, <coughs> um, the women and uh, you know, the, the Latinos? Um, and also on the, the gender gap, you keep mentioning that it, it was re re more or less the same as it was in 2008. Do you have any figures on, for the gender gap, percentages who voted Republican and Democrat? Thanks. Um, you you're, you're correct. A, a large uh, proportion of the ev evangelical voters in Colorado are in, are in Colorado Springs, El Paso County. I don't think that Colorado has a higher proportion of voters that are evangelical, although I, I guess I don't know for sure. Uh, it, it does come out to what we've talked about earlier in terms of turnout. I do think that Romney Ryan will have a huge turnout in El Paso County, which of course is a, uh, El Paso County is one of the, the, the largest, it is the largest Republican county in the state. Um, uh, in terms of the, the gender gap, uh, a guy has alluded to that, but I don't, I don't know what, to, what he was citing. So. Yeah, I don't know what it was in 2008. Yeah. Nationally, um, it was, uh, yeah. Obama won women by 13. It was probably similar in Colorado mm -hmm. um, and did split men. So that answers your question. No, um, but Obama won women by 13. Mm -hmm. And I think McCain won men by about one. So the total gap was about 12 points. Um, another question from the audience? Yes. Jonathan Easley with The Hill. Um, Mr. Maskett, you said that uh, the Obama campaign has 48 field offices set up in Colorado and the Romney campaign only has nine. Is that right? What's, what's kind of the reason for that disparity? And uh, m maybe Mr. Wadhams can comment too. Does it say something about the strength of the uh, Republican Party's infrastructure in the state? Um, I think uh, part of the reason for the disparity is that the Obama folks simply had a head start. Um, while the Romney team was still involved with primaries and caucuses all across the country, uh, the Obama folks had a lot of money that they weren't spending on a primary challenger, um, and they were using that to build up field offices, which I, I believe the evidence shows that worked pretty well for them four years ago. Um, I don't know if the Romney folks are going for parity with that, but my understanding is that, that they are using um, some of their considerable resources to build up more offices. Uh, yeah, I, I will say that, uh, yeah, Governor Romney didn't win the nomination until, uh, what, April, uh, officially. So he, he is, the, the victory effort, that's the name of the Republican get out the vote effort, uh, did start after uh, the Obama campaign. But I would mention this, is that uh, the, the, the Romney Republican get out the vote effort in Colorado will be very well done. Uh, two years ago, uh, and I want to congratulate Guy Cecil for Bennett's win in 2010 because uh, it was, it was in, uh, against the, uh, the tide of Republicans winning back at one house of the state legislature, uh, unseating two uh, statewide elected officials, unseating two incumbent members of Congress, which was the first time all those things had happened in, uh, in a couple of decades. Um, and so, um, and it was a, a large part of that was due to the Republican turnout effort. And I say that with some immodesty because I was state chairman at the time. <laughs> but, uh, but I do, but the same people who ran that campaign the, the turnout campaign in 2010 are running it in 2012. And, and believe me, I think the Republican effort will be, I think in 2012 will be superior to the Obama campaign. It was not in 2008. They had a lot of, a lot of advantages in 2008, but I believe it will be superior to Obama in 2012. So Dick, did Senator Bennett's win mask some of what was really going on in your view in Colorado? I do, yes I do. And, and once again, it was a, it's a great tribute to Guy Cecil and the campaign they ran to pull that victory out because as you all know the the governor's race went totally off the rails with with our party nominating an, an incompetent and unqualified candidate 
And then my friend. Uh, that always helps. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was a real inspiring moment for me. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, our friend uh, Tom Tancredo, who uh, you kind of alluded to in general earlier, <laughs> uh, really made that a lot of fun. But, um, uh, but, but the Senate race was actually in, in contrast to everything else that was going on on the ground in Colorado. And it took uh, a lot of mistakes by my friend Ken Buck to allow that to happen, but <laughs> you, you did a great job taking advantage of it, guys, so thanks. So, uh, I think we're about out of time, but we have time for one more question um, from the audience. I've seen a few other hands up. Yes. Hi, thank you. You've alluded to um, some of the, the uh, races in 2010. Can you allude to some of the, uh, are there uh, down ballot races that you think will impact um, the presidential race or vice versa that the presidential race may impact down ballot races um, at the congressional level and, and even further down? Um, anyone? Uh, just the guy looks like he and Dick both look like they have something to say, shockingly. And yeah. Seth, you might as well. And, and Sam, great. That's right. Um, Surprisingly, I don't have that much to say. Okay. Uh, look, I think there's a normal interplay between yeah. down ballot races and the yeah. presidential. Sure. I'm not sure it's any different in Colorado than it would be anywhere else. House races, in particular, seem to be um, seem to be affected more by presidential races than statewide races that have the capacity to really advertise on their own. So, I would expect there would be some impact on. I think there's maybe a couple of House races that are remotely competitive in the state. But you know, in I, 2008, Obama won Colorado by quite a bit. It was like mm -hmm. eight points, right? Yeah. And so were candidates trying to uh, attach themselves to his coattails in ways that mm -hmm. they won't be this time around? I, I would say this, Dee Dee, that the, the current state legislature, both houses are in play in 2012. And I do think that whoever carries Colorado in the presidential will greatly impact that. Because if you look at where the competitive seats are for the House and the Senate, they're in those parts of Jefferson and Arapahoe counties in particular, once again, that have the most competitive legislative seats. So if, if Romney carries Colorado, there's a reasonable chance we can win both houses. If Obama carries Colorado, they will retain control in the Senate and possibly win the House. Yeah, I just want to say that the marijuana initiative, I think, is one that mm -hmm. might have some impact. It's hugely popular with younger voters, the sort of voters that, that really had enthusiasm for Obama that may have dampened some in the, in the four years of governing. Uh, if they come out strongly and the Obama administration doesn't do anything to, to antagonize them over this issue, uh, that could be one that, that really uh, has, has some sway. Well, that, that's a very good point because one of the concerns of the Obama campaign is how do we get the margins among those young voters who, if they vote, will vote disproportionately for the president. Um, and are they also showing disproportional support for the initiative? And is there a campaign being run, and I'm sure there is on the pro side, that's targeting those voters? Yeah, so it, it's, it's much more popular among younger voters. And they're you know, just looking at the, the advertising that you see on the, on the web. And th there's a huge push online to, to get youth voters energized around that uh, proposition. And again, those are exactly the sort of voters that had a lot of enthusiasm for Obama four years is ago. There much t is there any television advertising around it? Or they I haven't, seen, it out I haven't like seen any. I, uh, it, it, it is one that doesn't have great salience now, but I imagine as, as we get closer and closer to the election, probably will. It's going to be fascinating. And I suppose the Obama campaign could, re I mean, the Obama administration could dampen their enthusiasm again by stepping on the. Uh, right. They came out really strongly against uh, Proposition uh, 9 in, in California. Right. Uh, right in the few weeks before the election, they really came out very strongly against it. It had been polling favorably and ended up losing by about seven percentage points. So, so uh, a lot yet to play out on, exactly. on this ballot measure. Exactly. Um, Oh, I mean, just, just to okay. dovetail off something Dick was saying earlier, in, in 2004, uh, George W. Bush won the state of Colorado by about five points. Mm -hmm. That same election, uh, Democrats oh. took over both houses oh. of, the, of, the, of the state yeah. legislature for the first Good time point. in like 40 years. Um, mm -hmm. So there is going to be a separate turnout effort going on for those races as well, and, and especially given how closely both chambers are right now. And then yeah. that may affect the presidential race. Yeah. One may affect the other. Um, so on that note, I think there's a lot uh, left to happen in Colorado, both between now and uh, the debate on October 3rd at, Den at the University of Denver, and a lot uh, between the debate and election day. It's going to be an exciting time, and it could all come down to Colorado. I have one last question. Um, we haven't talked about Are there any um, 
what maybe Guy and I would call voter suppression efforts, um, <laughs> the <laughs> efforts going on in Colorado. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, so just to so, so, uh, on, uh, and, and on requiring voter ID or, or anything like that. Dee Dee, yes. I, would, I would personally <laughs> <laughs> not accept your, your premise. I know. I, I, I added myself there at the end. I know no one knows what my politics are. Um, but, um, so there are, the legislature has passed in Colorado voter ID requirements. Well, I should say there is a movement of foot, underfoot to uh, pass a voter ID law similar to what we're seeing in Pennsylvania that's being spearheaded by our Secretary of State. Got it. Um, and I think that kind of goes back to the question of demographics. People are well aware of shifting demographics in our state. And so um, while there's certainly formal barriers to participation, i.e. not being citizens, we're also seeing some indications of informal attempts uh, to uh, suppress the vote in predominantly minority communities. I, I, I don't see that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, with all due respect, I don't agree Just with that. Voter but, empowerment <laughs> but that's, across that's fine. the country. <laughs> um, no, uh, so, but I bring that up because we, this could come down to a state like Colorado, and it, there could be challenges around new laws that are passed. And so, I, again, to reiterate, there is a lot left to happen. Um, thank you all for being here to hear this fascinating discussion about what a lot of that looks like. We look forward to seeing you at the debate uh, and on Election Day. So thank you very much. Thank you.